I want to begin this new audio series on modernist philosophy with um, a discussion of Henri Bergson's 1907 masterpiece, Creative Evolution. Bergson has not uh, read much these days. Um, he fell out of fashion. He had already fallen out of, the fa out of fashion by the time Deleuze uh, wrote his book on him in 1966 called Bergsonism. Uh, but for Deleuze, Bergson was a major philosopher, one of his favorite. And both Bergson and Deleuze, it should be noted, um, share an interest in accounting for, uh, Deleuze uses the term difference, uh, but Bergson uses the term creative evolution to account for the emergence of a singularity, the emergence of novelty and creativity and change. Uh, both philosophers are interested, in other words, in theories of morphogenesis, and so uh, Bergson's influence on Deleuze should be marked in that sense. Also, Deleuze said that um, one of the major contributions that Bergson made to philosophy is his concept of the multiplicity. Um, creative Evolution is his third main work. It's 1907, but before that he had written two other important works, Time and Free Will in 1889 and Matter and Memory in 1896. But it's in Time and Free Will that he works out this conception of the multiplicity by making a distinction in that work between quantitative multiplicities and qualitative multiplicities. Basically, uh, Time and Free Will is a reaction against Immanuel Kant, in which he says that Kant failed to make a distinction between time and space in such a way that he says basically time and space constitute the phenomenal realm, uh, the causal nexus that, that is held together by the laws of causality within which everything that happens takes place in a deterministic fashion. Uh, so the freedom of the individual is something that exists outside of this causal nexus, outside of time and space. It's noumenal. The individual is noumenally free, and his freedom is not bound by either time or space. But Bergson thinks that Kant basically fails there to separate time cleanly out and away from space, because for him, the whole concept of what he invents as absolutely central to his philosophy is this notion of duration, or la durée, in which la durée is essentially time, in which uh, time is really the dimension of creativity and freedom, especially the freedom of the universe to create new forms, and it is also the realm of internal interior consciousness. Um, the quantitative multiplicities are those that have to do with spatial units which are homogeneous and spread out in space, like if you imagine a field of sheep you have a homogeneous multiplicity there of essentially identical units that are that, that are spread out in space. Mathematics comes out of this. Whereas with respect to the realm of qualitative multiplicities, qualitative multiplicities are not homogeneous but heterogeneous and they flow through time. And they have to do with interior states of consciousness that succeed each other, one after the next, through the flow of time. La durée is this interior temporal dimension that living beings have access to, especially human living beings, have access to as this realm in which they do find their freedom. So freedom for Bergson is something that uh, is in time and that is essential to this notion of la durée. And intuition, another one of Bergson's central concepts, is this faculty in us that is absolutely opposed to the understanding, to intellect, insofar as it's this kind of vestigial holdover from the realm of instincts that enables us to get access, internal access, to this realm of thoughts and memories and feelings by means of which uh, we can attain unity with the whole, with, with, with the, entire, the entirety of duration by accessing through memory states that can be uh, basically accessed and entered into via the mode of intuition. And the main thing then about La Durée is that the past is always at work in the present. Um, he'll start off in a second, uh, we'll look at creative evolution as he, he starts off by re recapitulating this idea from time and free will. So that's the concept of multiplicity, spatial multiplicities and temporal multiplicities that Deleuze inherits from Bergson. Bergson was born in 1859, the year of Darwin's origin of species, and he died in 1941 at the age of 81. So he lived a good, long, healthy life. And after Creative Evolution, there's really only one more significant book that he publishes in the 1930s on the two sources of morality and religion. Uh, but those are his four main books. And we're going to look here at Creative Evolution, uh, which also had, in addition to influencing Deleuze, had a big influence on Whitehead, especially Whitehead's writing of process and reality. 
Also a big influence on Oswald Spangler. Spangler's little book, Man and Technics, uh, derives quite a bit, actually, from, from Bergson's uh, creative evolution, which then I want to proceed to move into and look at now. Um, in the introduction to creative evolution, Bergson begins by saying that there is this faculty in man called the intellect. And the intellect is basically something that is modeled upon the exterior world of inorganic substances, what he calls solids. Geometry is built up by the intellect as one of its primary tools for understanding the, the exterior world of inorganic bodies, the realm of solids. Uh, geometry is the science par excellence of solids. And the intellect is something that is within man that evolution has gradually worked out as a sort of organ or appendage. Uh, it's a part that has been produced by the evolutionary whole as a tool for to enable the individual to survive. Um, so to try to reduce, as the mechanist does, the understanding of the entire exterior world in terms merely of the intellect's way of understanding things. And its way of understanding things, he says in the introduction, has to do with the application of its categories, categories like the Kantian categories or the categories of mechanistic causality to the outer world. The outer world never quite really fits comfortably into the categories of the intellect which sort of, they're useful, but they slide off. They, they never fully encompass the diversity and complexity of the outward phenomena of the world of unorganized matter. And so uh, the intellect is this tool that is useful, but to try to capture the entirety of phenomena within a merely mechanistic understanding, and the intellect for Bergson really is a mechanistic, it's a tool that really only enables a scientific or mechanistic understanding of the world in terms of causality, in terms of the causality principle. And it doesn't really work for him. He says that um, what we need to do is to realize that in evolution there have been other forms of consciousness that have evolved through the entire history of evolution. And it could be the case that these other forms of consciousness could come to the aid of the intellect, and the intellect could then use them to obtain a, whole, a holistic picture of creation which is then what he's going to try to do because though he doesn't mention it in the introduction, what he's talking about is intuition and instinct. Instinct, uh, it will turn out, will be opposed to intelligence as the two main streams that living forms have developed. And intuition will turn out to be a faculty within the human mind that is a sort of holdover from the realm of the instincts that enables the individual to access the realm of duration, la durée, through a kind of sympathetic resonance, a kind of mystical getting into the inside of the realm of phenomena. And so he moves on then into part one, uh, chapter one. In chapter one, the book is divided into four chapters. Um, and chapter one is divided into a number of subsections. I just want to look at the first subsection here in this introductory video. Uh, chapter one is entitled The Evolution of Life, Mechanism and Teleology. Now what he's going to do, though it, it is very clear that he is a kind of vitalist, that he is uh, trying to evolve what Whitehead calls a philosophy of the organism in opposition, especially to mechanism. Nonetheless, he does believe that mechanism and teleology have both failed. Teleology is the, is the way of understanding the world in organismic terms as a realm of final causes, whereas mechanism understands the world in terms of uh, efficient and material causes. Teleology is the realm of understanding, the, the, the way of understanding the world in terms of the final causes that puts the cause at the end uh, and sees everything leading up toward that cause. The problem with that, though, for Bergson is that if you put the cause at the end, let's say the cause of the acorn beginning to sprout is the ultimate final cause of its maturity as a tree. That's the final cause that is, as it were, acting as a basin of attraction from the future to draw the acorn up out of the ground and, and, and to act in an organismic way as a final cause. But the problem with that for Bergson, he's trying to find, uh, fly a middle ground here between mechanism and teleology with his own philosophy of creative evolution is that it doesn't account, it doesn't allow for the true emergence of novelty, the unexpected. If you already have a final cause that's present in the beginning, then nature already knows, as it were, what it's going to do, and you, you can't, there's no room for, for singularity. There's no room for what Deleuze will later call difference, the production of novelty and singularity and something radically new in nature. Whereas with mechanism, the cause is put at the beginning, and the world uh, unfolds itself in accordance with efficient causes that go booming along, cause, effect, cause, effect, like billiard balls, 
uh, that put the cause at the beginning, but there again, nothing really new ever emerges from that understanding of the world in terms of merely efficient causes. So both theories fail for him. And so though he is a kind of organicist or vitalist, um, it's a vitalist of a very special kind because he's trying to construct a theory that emerges for, uh, that accounts for the emergence of novelty and creativity and evolution. And what he's going to see is that um, what has to be done is not to look at the future, at the final causes that are in the future, but to go back to the root of life and to see it all as having originated um, at its inception in a primary motive force, what he will call the elan vital, the vital force or the energy that set life in motion, uh, and see it as unified there at, at root there, and then trace it as it then diversifies through processes of differentiation and divergence and specification and follow these tendencies as they move through this divergence and there's always this sense of uh, nature trying to produce individuals and then reproduce new ones and so on and he'll trace all of that uh, especially in the second chapter as he goes along here but now first what he starts to do is to recapitulate his theory from the earlier from the earlier work time and free will and matter and memory on duration la durée so he starts off by saying that if i examine my internal consciousness what I find there is that it's constantly in motion. It's constantly moving from one state to the next. There's a constant internal succession, such that it appears that no thought really uh, is ever the same thought. This is a sort of adaptation of Heraclitus' old idea that you can't step into the same river twice. And he's really applying that model to consciousness now, because this is essential to la durée, to the ascent, to, to his understanding of duration of time as essentially constantly in our internal consciousness producing a succession of states, each one of which is distinct from the other. And the reason for that is because as I live, the past is always piling up behind me. I'm always adding more to the past behind me, and the future is always diminishing in front of me. But the past is always changing. Every successive moment is becoming old. The moment it arises, it becomes old, but it's still there. And so all of these successive moments impinge on the present moment and change my perception so that I can never have the same perception of anything twice precisely because I have all these older perceptions and memories uh, many of the memories have been repressed down into the unconscious and most of all uh, I mainly only have access to those memories that serve me at the present moment but the idea of duration is that the past is always present and it's present in consciousness as a totality the, the sum totality of it is always there even though you may not have conscious access to it and a man's consciousness um, is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and it is never the same. There's always something different happening in consciousness. And to try to oppose the ego, and here's again is another uh, quibble with Kant, to try to oppose uh, this, the ego as a sort of um, unifying stability against this flow of consciousness is itself false. Because the ego basically is itself undergoing change. It is itself basically an illusion. And I already, I think we can see here in 1907, the tendency of the 20th century, of 20th century thinkers, we'll see it in Heidegger, we'll see it in Wittgenstein, in the Tractatus, is that, uh, is to dismantle the self and to pull apart uh, the transcendental self, the great Husserlian ego, the transcendental ego. It's, it's starting to come come apart here. Bergson's already regarding this, the ego as a, is basically an illusion, is basically something that's equally flowing through time and is absolutely unnecessary to act as a fundamental uh, permanent substrate across which our feelings and thoughts and memories and emotions flow, but that itself is also part of that river. It's flowing through time just as well as the, as the individual perceptions, and so it's an illusion. So for him, the ego is not really a necessary thing. But now he says, um, he says, now what about a material object? If I look out at the world at material objects um, of whatever kind, they, they seem to present very opposite characteristics to those which we have just been describing. He says, the material object either remains what it is, or else if it changes under the influence of an external force, then really what happens is that there's a displacement of parts which themselves do not change. Um, and if those parts change, then we have to split them up down into molecules, molecules down into atoms. So that the world of material objects really is not in duration in the same sense in which we can say that our consciousness is unfolding through time and duration. The outer world change happens there in such a way as really to fit the, the mechanistic theory that change is a function of simply shifting parts around. 
You're simply moving parts around, cutting them apart, putting them back together.